Hello, everyone. In Psalm 19, which is a psalm of David, David extols the word of God. He says that the law of the Lord is perfect, restoring my soul. The testimony of the Lord is sure, making wise the simple. The precepts of the Lord are right, rejoicing the heart. I appreciate so much your being with me again today in this Bible study. We're looking at the same word that uh, David was and David wrote about 3,000 years ago. The word of the Lord abideth forever, the Bible says, even though everything else will get old and eventually fade away and disappear. God's word will stand. And it's an honor to be involved in this uh, Bible study with you today and look at the word of the Lord together. I want to begin by relating a story. It's historical. It's true. Uh, there was a man by the name of Horatio Spafford. He was married, and he and his wife had four children. They lived in the city of Chicago. In fact, in 1871, Mr. Spafford and the family went through what became known as the Great Chicago Fire. It was, it was a terrible situation, a devastating thing for many, many people in the city at that time. Like others, the Spaffords lost virtually all of their worldly possessions, and so Horatio thought it would be wise to send uh, his wife and, and family uh, on a ship back to Europe, where they came from originally, to be with their family at that time. And so Mrs. Spafford and the four girls uh, boarded a ship, and somewhere in mid-Atlantic, unfortunately, so sadly, uh, that passenger ship struck another vessel and it sunk, and all four of those girls lost their lives. When Mrs. Spafford finally got to her destination in Europe, she sent a telegram back to Horatio telling him what had happened. Um, just devastated, of course, understandably. Uh, he decided to board a ship himself, and on the way to meet his wife in Europe, he asked the captain of that vessel if he would point out the spot where the other ship had gone down and he lost his four girls. The captain did so. And somewhere in mid-Atlantic during the evening hours, Horatio Spafford wrote these words, When peace like a river attendeth my way, when sorrows like sea billows roll, whatever my lot that has taught me to say, it is well with my soul. Ever since I learned the background of that song, I've never been able to sing it the same way. Whenever I stand uh, with God's people and hymn those great words, I think about Horatio Spafford. And I think about the tremendous faith in God that he had, and I can only hope that I could have the same kind of uh, faith that he did. Truly a story of a person who has implicit trust in God, and I don't think anybody could question his priorities in life. And when I do stand among a congregation of believers and sing this, it makes my heart swell with the assurance of God's power. And I'm just proud to be, and I use that word in the best way possible, I am proud to be a child of God. I am proud to be a Christian. However, my soul's welfare depends on more than just singing a song, even with gusto. The welfare of my eternal soul depends on its relation to my God and his inspired word. I'm going to repeat that just in case anyone missed it, because it is the focal point of our message today. My soul's welfare depends on its relation to God and his inspired word. If I am not in a good relation to God, I can sing words like, it is well with my soul, all that I want to. But if I'm not in a good relationship with the Lord and living in his good graces and serving him and believing every day and trusting and being an obedient child, then it is not well with my soul. And so the title of our message today, it is well with my soul, or is it? That's what I want us to think about in the light of what God has to say in the Bible. I want to ask you a personal question, if you will. Are you having trouble sleeping? Have you ever had trouble sleeping? I realize there's a lot of different I realize there's a lot of different reasons why a person could have some trouble sleeping at night, but if if we're having trouble sleeping because we have a biting conscience and we know way deep down somewhere inside that things are not so well with our soul, 
then first thing, I want you to take a page out of the Apostle Peter's book. Here's what I mean. In your New Testament, I hope you've got your Bible with you today and maybe even a, a pen and paper and can take some notes from our Bible study. But turn to the book of Acts and turn to chapter 12. We're going to look at the first several verses in the Acts of the Apostles, chapter 12. And the context is that King Herod here is very upset with the fact that there is this movement known as Christianity. And he doesn't like it, probably uh, because it threatens his power more than anything. So he's out to squelch this new movement. And the smart man that he was, he begins with a leadership. And he has put uh, James, the brother of John, to death in Acts 12, verse 2. And he sees that that pleases many of the Jews. They felt the same way he did about Christians. And so he, uh, he proceeds to arrest Peter also, and he arrests him, throws him in prison, and there is no doubt when you read the rest of the context of this passage that he fully intends to put the apostle Peter to death. In verse 5, Peter was kept in prison, and we see that the brothers and sisters there are praying fervently for him. They realize that th this is a, a, a dire situation. And so in verse 6 now, and on the very night when Herod was about to bring him forward, Peter was sleeping between two soldiers, bound with two chains and guards in front of the door were watching over the prison. Now tell me that's not amazing. Had you been thrown in prison, had I been thrown in prison, and I'm fully assured that my life is going to be taken from me you know, sometime very soon, it would be very difficult for me to sleep. Peter was at rest. Peter was sleeping. Peter could say, it is well with my soul, and mean it. Peter knew that his soul belonged to Christ Jesus, his Savior. Uh, when we look at that, we may say to ourselves, well, I sure would like to have Peter's assurance and Peter's repose in such a situation. Well, fine, and we can have that, but we've got to live like Peter, don't we? Peter had deep, deep faith and trust in God. And here's another thing about Peter. He had some problems, and that's why we love Peter, because he was so human, and the Bible allows us to see some of the, the quirks and problems that Peter had in his personality. There's one problem that Peter did not have, and that was dishonesty. Peter was honest with himself and with other people. So I've got to ask myself, can I be truly honest with myself? Do I stand and sing a hymn like this, It is well with my soul, when I know deep down it is not well with my soul? There's something wrong in my life, and I'm, I'm just um, kind of glossing over it, and I'm not dealing with the situation. Peter had a determination to do things God's way. And I need that, and you need that, all of us. If we're endeavoring to serve the Lord Jesus, we have to have a determination to do things God's way and not to be self-centered and try to do everything our own way and turn a blind eye toward our mistakes, our sins in this life. Now, remember that this is the same man to whom Jesus once said, Get thee behind me, Satan. Back in Matthew 16 and verse 23, Jesus said that to Peter because Peter was not putting his mind on the interests of God, Jesus informed him, but only uh, thinking as a man. He was thinking about things in a temporary and perhaps even materialistic kind of way. He was not considering the real uh, spiritual value and the teachings that Jesus had for him. He didn't understand it. But Peter would not give up. He would not give up. His faith prodded him on. He was devoted to the Word of God. In Acts chapter 2 and verse 42, um, this describes the early church. It really, the, the church is still in its infancy. And, uh, but people were devoted to the Word of the Lord. They were devoting themselves to the apostles' teaching. Well, one of those apostles happened to be Peter. In fact, he was the keynote speaker here earlier in Acts chapter 2. He, Peter, Peter was so determined to do things God's way, and he was, he was so um, given to the Word of God, and his faith was in 
uh, fully in God. And so when he taught, people listened to him. They knew it was the word of God for other reasons as well. He had the miracles to prove it. But here was a man that God could truly use because he was devoted to the word. It is well with my soul. Can you say that and mean it? It is well with my soul. Well, that's so important. Now, be careful. Be very careful, because I'm here to tell you another thing today. There are dangerous doctrines out there that give people, millions of people, a false sense of spiritual security. I'm afraid, and in, you know, in my job in my life, I deal with people all of the time and working with people, which is something I love to do. Uh, but I'm afraid that there are so many people who live with a false sense of spiritual security and they're thinking to themselves, well, I'm in, I'm in fine shape spiritually. It's well with my soul when in fact they are believing and obeying something other than what the Bible truly teaches. There's a doctrine out there that tells us that once a person is saved, they can never lose their salvation no matter how they may live their life. There is a quotation um, from a little pamphlet that was written years and years ago. I have it here. I'm going to read it to you, and, and I'm going to tell you who said it. And if you want a copy of this, you just let me know. You email me or text me, and, and I'll give you a copy of this. Because when I read it to people, people are incredulous. It's like they, nobody would be crazy enough to say something like that. Well, this man did. And his name was Bill Foster. He was a Baptist preacher. This was recorded in Louisville, Kentucky years ago. And he accepted this doctrine that once you are saved, it virtually does not matter how you live the remainder of your life. There's no way that you can lose your soul. The Bible does not teach that. I mean, if we really believe that, we may as well throw our Bibles away and live as we please. He said, and I quote, if I killed my wife and mother and debauched a thousand women, I couldn't go to hell. In fact, I couldn't go to hell if I wanted to. If on the judgment day I should find that my loved ones are lost and should lose all desire to be saved and should beg God to send me to hell with them, he couldn't do it. It's not that he wouldn't do it, he couldn't do it. And if he did, he would be a liar because he said no one can pluck them out of my hand. Well, that is a blatant misapplication of something Jesus said in John chapter 10. You read the context of that, and Jesus is not teaching the doctrine that this man teaches. I guess, you know, the idea that once you, you've come to the Lord, it doesn't matter how you live afterward, you're not going to lose your salvation is comfortable. That's a pretty comforting doctrine, at least on the surface. But I can tell you this, it fails the prove by the scripture test because scripture doesn't teach any such thing. It's, it's sad to me that millions of people accept things like this without researching, without really carefully reading their Bible to see if the Bible um, teaches a doctrine like this. Perhaps there are people who are sleeping well at night that actually need to wake up and look more carefully at what the Bible says so that they can gain a true assurance of the welfare of the soul. Faith is not something that occurs once in my life when I believe this is the way salvation is represented sometimes, that, you know, there's a moment and we believe this part is true. We're going to reach a point in life where we make a decision to serve God. But it's not merely something that occurs once in life when we are knocked down on our road to Damascus, if you will, the way that Saul was in Acts the ninth chapter. In fact, that was just the beginning of a life of faithfulness to Saul. And he knew that, and he spent the rest of his life writing things that very definitely teach us that the faith you exemplify when you first come to Jesus is just the beginning. You must nurture that faith and feed that faith. God is not going to do that for you. God does many great and mighty things for us, but, but please read your Bible and understand that there are things that God will not do for you and me. That's our part in salvation. 
Saul knew that. Saul that became Paul, he knew that, and he spent the rest of his life, as he says in 1 Corinthians chapter 9, even buffeting his body so that it would be his servant because he knew that temptation was everywhere, and he knew, 1 Corinthians 9 verses 27 in the context, that he could fail the test and lose his soul if he didn't do that. I'm going to read some verses here in just a moment that make that very clear to us. But please don't let anybody deceive you into thinking that everything is fine no matter what because you believed in Jesus 20 years ago or whatever it was. The Christian life is something that we need to feed and nurture and make certain that it's growing. That's the way growth occurs by us providing the right environment for things. You know, it's like a tender plant that was planted. If we're going to allow this acorn to grow into a mighty oak tree, we're going to have to take care of it. God will be, be nurturing it too all of the way. Don't misunderstand me through his word. But we must put our faith in his word. We must be obedient each and every day. Somebody told me a long time ago that living the Christian's li Christian life is a lot like shaving, a man shaving his face. Uh, no matter how good you do it today, you're going to have to get up tomorrow and do it all over again. And there's a lot of truth to that. There's a lot of truth to that. We need to recognize that. It is well with my soul, or is it? I need to contemplate that question very carefully to be certain that it is well with my soul. Now, listen to the Bible. Several verses of Scripture I want to read with you. We're going to First Peter chapter 1 and verse 5, and I want us to read verses 5 and 10. If you're acquainted with the New Testament, you've probably read this passage many times before, but read it again with me today and allow these words to sink into your mind and just get all the good that uh, God wants us to get out of a beautiful passage like this. First Peter chapter 1 verse 5. He's talking about Christians, you who are protected by the power of God through faith for a salvation ready to be revealed in the last time. Think about that. We are protected by God. That's what God is doing for us. But it's the protection of the power of God is through our faith, ready for a salvation to be revealed in the last time. It's interesting that often in the New Testament, salvation is presented in two different ways. There's a sense in which we have it. There is a sense in, in which we get to a certain point in life where we accept the truth of Jesus Christ and who he is and what he is as our Savior and our Redeemer. We accept that and we give our lives over to that. And yet the word salvation is often used in this sense as well, that we don't have the fullness of our salvation until we die and our bodies are resurrected and we're with the Lord in heaven. Both of those are true. And if we can understand the concept that once saved, always saved is simply not true, but once we are saved, now we have to grow in that salvation so that we can have the fullness of it and be able to stand in the glory of God in eternity, not in time, but in eternity, then we can see that I have a responsibility to feed my faith all along the way. I want to go to 2 Peter chapter 1 now, because this is almost a commentary on what Peter is saying in 1 Peter chapter 1. Here's the faith. Remember what he said in 1 Peter 1, 5 about faith. Now look at 2 Peter 1, 5. Now for this very reason also, applying all diligence. If somebody has to find diligence as hard work. That's a pretty good practical definition of it. In your faith, listen to the Apostle Peter. This is the guy that was sleeping when he knew that he might die the next day. By the way, God delivered him. If you don't read the rest of Acts 12, you won't know that, but God delivered him. Applying all diligence in your faith supply moral excellence or virtue. In that knowledge, in your knowledge, self-control, in your self-control, perseverance, in your perseverance, godliness, in your godliness, brotherly kindness, and in your brotherly kindness, love. Why, Peter? Why should I bother? If I can't lose my salvation, what does it matter if I do this? What does it matter if I grow? I don't care. I'm going to heaven when I die. Isn't that all that matters? 
Well, there's more to it, Peter says. If you don't apply these things in your life, you may very well not see heaven in the by and by. Listen to him. Verse 8, if these qualities are yours and are increasing, they render you neither useless nor unfruitful in the true knowledge of our Lord Jesus Christ. Well, let me posit a question to you in verse 8. If these qualities are yours and are increasing, then you're not rendered useless, which means you are useful. So if you do not have these qualities in your life, what would the opposite truth be? The opposite truth, my friend, is that you and I would be useless. You and I would be unfruitful. You mean to tell me I can live a life of uselessness and unfruitfulness and not doing anything for the Lord, not giving my life back to him in service, and he'll still welcome me in heaven? That's a crazy notion, isn't it? It just mocks God, and it mocks the truthfulness of his word. In verse 9, he who lacks these qualities is blind or short-sighted, having forgotten the purification from his former sins. You mean to tell me I can completely forget what Jesus did for me on Calvary's cross? It doesn't even matter? That's foolishness. Don't let anybody deceive you into believing that and telling you it is well with your soul. When you're accepting things that do not save the soul, listen to me, they will damn the soul eternally. In verse 10, therefore, brethren, be all the more diligent to make certain about his calling and choosing you for as long as you practice these things, you will never stumble. So what if I quit practicing these things? I will stumble and I'll fall flat on my face. What a powerful passage of Scripture. Verse 11 is the conclusion in this way. The entrance into the eternal kingdom of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ will be abundantly supplied to you. That is, if I continue adding these qualities to my faith, if I continue being obedient to the Lord and strengthening my faith day by day, I will have the wherewithal, I will have the spiritual strength to say no to temptation and yes to Jesus, and I will live a life that is pleasing to him. Perfect? No, this is not about sinlessness or human perfection. This is about proving how much I love God and demonstrating my faith to God. And let me tell you, love and faith have something in common. They have to be demonstrated. They have to be demonstrated. I can tell my wife each and every day that I love her, but if I don't act like it, she knows better. Love and faith must be proved, must be demonstrated. We know that. If it works that way with other relationships, it will most assuredly work that way in our relationship with God. Right here in 2 Peter chapter 2 and in verse 20, talking about those who had been saved and if after they escape the defilements of the world by the knowledge of the Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, that's being saved. They are again entangled in them and overcome. The last state has become worse for them than the first. It would be better for them not to have known the way of righteousness than having known it to turn away from the holy commandment delivered to them. It it was a better situation for them when they were lost before they ever knew the truth than it is now after having known the truth and seeing the beauty of Jesus and the holiness of God's word and then turning their back on that. It's even worse. Sure it is. They are spitting in the face of God. Don't let anybody deceive you into thinking the welfare of your soul is good. And you can say it is well with my soul when in fact it may not be. I am either growing closer to God each day or I am growing away from God each day. There is no middle ground. Jesus said in Matthew chapter 12, you're either with me or against me. Clear as anything could be. There were Christians in the church at Laodicea in Revelation chapter 3. I'll let you read that passage, verses 14 to 19. And they were boastful. Jesus comes to them and and uh, and he confronts them because they had a certain arrogance. Everything is just fine with us. And Jesus says, no, it is not. He tells them, you're neither hot nor cold. You're just, you're just uh, lukewarm, and you're not doing anything. He says, I will spit you out of my mouth. doesn't sound like a group of people that are saved to me. 
arrogance will kill us spiritually. Just ignoring the weaknesses and sins in our life without turning to him and relying on his strength and his word and doing what we have to do that God will not do for us, those things are not going to help us or save us. There's a passage in Philippians chapter 2 that I think strikes this balance between what God is doing in our salvation and the things that God says we must do in our salvation. It strikes the balance as well as any passage in the Bible that I know of. Read it with me. Philippians chapter 2, verses 12 and 13. So then, my beloved, just as you have always obeyed, not as in my presence only, but now much more in my absence, this is Paul to the church at Philippi, work out your salvation with fear and trembling. I'll tell you something, if we don't understand that, it's because we're working pretty hard not to understand it. How clear is that admonition? Work out your salvation and do it with fear and with trembling. God is someone to be feared. In Matthew chapter 10, verses 28 through 30, Jesus taught that principle. He said, don't be afraid of those who can kill the body. Fear him who can throw both body and soul in hell. And do so with trembling. This is not a game you are playing. Salvation, your, your life in Christ is not a game. But now look at what he says in verse 13. Here's the flip side of it. There's two sides to every coin. For it is God who is at work in you, both to will and to work for his good pleasure. God is at work in me. My faith comes by hearing the word of God. God has given me this word. Thank you, Lord, for doing that. And so by the word of God living in my heart and in my mind and my feeding on that, and uh, activating my faith and being obedient to that. God is working in me, and he's doing things that I, I cannot do. At the same time, I'm the one who has to respond. I'm the one who has to respond. That's my job. And when we respond in humility and in faith and obedience, and we're working together with our God, and he assures us by doing that each day for a lifetime, heaven will be ours. That's the assurance we have. Love and faith must be demonstrated to be real. Otherwise, it is not well with my soul. We sing another hold hymn sometimes. I'm sure you're aware of it. It's called Standing on the Promises of God my Savior. Well, let me tell you, we, we stand on all the promises of God, the positive and the negative, the ones that bless us and the ones that warn us. First Peter chapter 3 and verse 12, for the eyes of the Lord are upon the righteous and his ears attend to their prayer. I stand on that promise and I glory in that promise that God is with me and he's here. He hears my prayers because he's promised me that. But listen to the other promise directly afterward, but the face of the Lord is against those who do evil. You can stand on that promise as well. Stand on the promises of God, all of them, each and every one of them. Listen to me, please, today. God will never violate your free will, and anybody who tells you as a human being you don't even have free will, the sovereignty of God is such that there's nothing you can do in your salvation. Don't believe that. Go to the Bible and read it. You will not come out with a doctrine like that if you read God's word with an open mind. God will never violate your free will. He's the one that made us this way, and he did so for a reason. He is involved in your life through the Bible, through your faith in his word. But you also will determine your eternal destiny through the decisions that you make and the desires that you allow to live in your life each day. Don't live with a false sense of security. You don't have to. Base your salvation not on your feelings, not even to the words of a beautiful song or other people you know in life, but base your salvation squarely upon what God says. You'll never regret it, and you'll be able to sing. It is well with my soul, and mean it, and know it. May God richly bless you this day. Thank you. I'll see you again.